investigation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, special welcome to all those who came from uh, out of town, and also a special welcome to my friend and colleague uh, Fabrice, who came from the east end of Montreal. Uh, given the, the state of roads in Montreal today, it may have been a more difficult uh, transportation than flying in from out of town. Um, what I want to do is, is sort of set the stage for uh, many of the speakers that will speak after me. Uh, and I thought that I would take a little bit of a, uh, a historic license, if you will, since uh, I'm surrounded by historians, um, to sort of put uh, what I want to say in a certain uh, context. And I thought the best way to do that would be to show you this slide which comes from a lecture that was given several years ago by Clayton Christensen, who's a professional of business at uh, Harvard Business School, uh, who was talking about uh, disruptive innovation. And basically, he showed this slide to make uh, a point uh, to explain what the concept of, of centralization and decentralization was. And uh, I'm going to use this as a jumping off point uh, to get to uh, what's happening in medicine. Uh, fundamentally, what this slide shows you is that uh, several decades ago, uh, and some of us will remember this, uh, we used to use slide rules uh, to do complicated uh, uh, calculations. And I remember using a slide rule <clears throat> in my uh, undergraduate physics class at McGill. And in fact, I was in the first class at McGill that had requested we be allowed to use handheld calculators, and we were told, no, we could not. Um, so we were stuck with the slide rule. Um, all this to say, somewhere around uh, the end of uh, World War II, uh, with the advent of mainframe uh, computing, uh, this was the beginning of the centralization of computing and computer science uh, as we know it today. And what's important to understand is why centralization took place, because it's going to be a comparable story when we get to medicine. Centralization took place in the 40s and 50s and early 60s in uh, the computerization of industry for two reasons. One is because it was just too expensive for everybody to go out and buy a mainframe computer. So uh, mainframe computers existed sporadically here and there, uh, mainly because of the huge cost required to purchase and maintain them. But secondly, the expertise required to set up a mainframe, maintain a mainframe, and make sure that it worked uh, was also in very short supply at that time. So there were not very many um, universities, uh, companies uh, with mainframe computers. Sometime in the early 70s, early to mid 70s, mini computers uh, came onto the scene, which were obviously somewhat cheaper than mainframe computers, uh, didn't require the intellectual and capital overhead to maintain, and this began the decentralization, of we understand it today, of uh, computerization of society. Um, I'm also uh, perhaps old enough to remember, as many of you are, the introduction of desktop computers in the late 1970s, and uh, thereafter the rapid introduction of, of laptop computers, notebook computers, and in the last 10 years, the, the smartphone, uh, which we all use. So this, uh, I think, is a very good representation of uh, how we went from the centralization of uh, computerization to a decentralized uh, uh, computer environment. I want to use that now to jump right into medicine because the same sort of story applies to what happened in medicine uh, at the turn of the last century, the 19th into the 20th century and throughout the 20th century. Large medical centers as we know them really only came into being, at least in North America, after World War I. Uh, and the reason for that was very similar to the reason for the original centralization of computerization. The cost of medical equipment at the time, such as it was, was just enormous and could not be afforded by everybody. And the expertise, the medical knowledge, not only to run the equipment, but to treat disease, to diagnose disease, was also in very short supply 
uh, the early uh, years of the, the 20th century. And so large medical centers came into being, and we all know what these large medical centers are in North America. In Quebec, uh, there was uh, University of Montreal de Chum, there was McGill, uh, Ontario University of Toronto, not many, many others across Canada at that point. In the United States, the Johns Hopkins of, uh, of the country, um, uh, Massachusetts General, and, and many other well-known <laughs> institutions. It was only in the late 70s and early 80s that things began to move out of large medical centers. And they began to move out of large medical centers primarily for two reasons. One is, uh, with the emerging and evolving technology, the cost of technology became a lot less the size of technology became smaller, uh, the ease of use of technology became a lot easier, and therefore things that could only used to be done in a large medical center moved into community hospitals, then into clinics, and more recently into offices, uh, strip malls, and, and people's living rooms, so to speak. The other uh, main uh, mover in the decentralization of medicine in the last 15 years, I would say, is uh, the fact that allied healthcare professionals began to practice at a much higher level uh, in their license than they had previously. So what this means is uh, things uh, that only specialty physicians could do or would do up until recently are now done by family physicians and GPs. Things that would be done uh, or could be done by family physicians until recently are now done by uh, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, nurse clinicians, specialists, and other allied healthcare professionals. And things that were done, could be done by nurse practitioners are now being done by other allied healthcare professionals, including uh, pharmacists out in their pharmacies. So. You can see that we went from this era of, of centralization that began in the uh, early 20th century in medicine and rapidly through this decentralization, which we're living through today, which I would say began probably in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And I'm putting it out this way because this really sets the stage uh, to ask the question, where do we go from here? And so, um, what I'm going to show you is, is a paradigm that I've been thinking about for uh, at least the last uh, year or so, um, which uh, at least makes sense to me. And I would love to hear uh, your comments after I've, I've presented it. But all this comes back to this notion of, of the tremendous disruption that we're all living through uh, in healthcare today. And it began with this decentralization, as I indicated on the previous slide, which um, <coughs> probably really uh, came into its own in the last uh, 10 years. <coughs> and as I showed you on the last two slides, <coughs> the decentralization uh, really is divided between uh, the emerging technology and the upscaling of people and what people are capable of doing. And the way I think about this is uh, the emerging technology, the fact that technology is much more pervasive, much more available, much more easily used, has led to what I call the democratization of technology. It used to be that certain technology only resided in the large medical centers, could only be used by certain people, and now that's no longer the case. Similarly, uh, medical knowledge used to reside in the, the minds of medical specialists. Um, and through uh, the, the change in credentialing that we've observed over the last uh, 10 or 12 years, uh, I think we've arrived at a point now which I call the democratization of knowledge, uh, which allows all L uh, allied healthcare professionals uh, a stake in uh, caring for uh, users of the healthcare system. And I think these two parallel lines of development are absolutely uh, key. Uh, in addition to the traditional technology that we're all familiar with, uh, there are at least two or three other things that have come on the scene in the last uh, couple of years, really, which are really taking over uh, medicine as we know it. Um, 
This relates to what are called the Internet of Things uh, and wearables and remote sensing. And uh, these are going to become increasingly important, uh, especially for those of us who, who run large hospitals, large academic medical centers, uh, as it becomes possible to do things outside of the four walls of the hospital. It also becomes less costly to do things outside the walls of the hospital and more convenient for the patients to move things out into their living room, really, rather than to bring people into the hospital. So wearables, uh, remote sensing, and the Internet of Things, really, I think, is, is going to be the, the future uh, of where we're going. Just on, on parenthes, um, it's interesting, last year I had an opportunity to uh, visit with uh, several European groups in Germany at a um, cybersecurity and healthcare conference. And I, I was amazed and somewhat alarmed to learn um, within the context of, of the Internet of Things that it's now possible to hack in to a hospital information network through a CT scanner or an MR scanner. And then once you hack in through the scanner, all the instruments and equipment that are on the hospital network are hackable. And what they demonstrated at this conference is that you could actually access a respirator in an intensive care unit and remotely change the settings on the respirator and kill somebody. Uh, so when we talk about hacking and cybersecurity, that's where we are today. Uh, and that's a very important part of what, uh, where we're heading. Along with the emergence of the technology, as, as I've described it, not only better technology, <coughs> cheaper technology, more mobile technology, easier to use technology, is, is the fact that everything that can be digitalized is being digitalized. And I don't think we can underestimate the, uh, the consequence of that. So artificial intelligence and machine learning related to it, uh, big data, all of this uh, is, is going to change the face of what we understand to be uh, healthcare and healthcare delivery. And perhaps even more important, or at least equally important, is the notion uh, of blockchain technology and where blockchain technology will actually fit in in this whole paradigm of uh, evolving uh, healthcare delivery and, and healthcare. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, as well, uh, I don't have to uh, tell you about the revolution that uh, is the internet, which uh, we've all lived with now for at least the last uh, 20 years or so, 24 years. Uh, I remember sitting in my, my basement at home in 1994, and, and because I was on staff at McGill, I had one of the earlier accesses to the internet and, and email through the university service. And I remember having some of my relatives come over for dinner that night, and they saw me online, and they said, what are you wasting your time doing? They said, this is completely ridiculous. This will never catch on. So that was in 1994. Um, Needless to say, um, the sons of the people I had invited over that night are both in information technology today and are both heavily involved in the internet uh, industry. Um, related to, to this, though, um, is what I call uh, the new digital innovators. And it's important to understand that not only are things evolving uh, in the technological world and in the university academic world and in the medical world, but things are evolving very quickly in the business commercial world uh, as well. And uh, there are four types of companies now that are reacting um, very quickly to this evolving uh, landscape, all of which will have implications for how we practice what we do and who does what. So just for an example, there are four types of company now uh, in healthcare delivery. Uh, the first one I would characterize as what are called lean innovators, which are companies like generic drug companies, uh, companies that uh, uh, as part of their innovation uh, produce generic drugs uh, very cheaply so that 
people around the world can benefit from the huge advances being made in, in, in pharmacology. Uh, you may not consider that to be very innovative, but uh, it, obviously, at a certain extent, it is. There are another whole host of companies which are called around the patient innovators, and I would point to Novartis as being one of these. These are companies such as uh, large uh, pharmaceutical companies like Roche, like Novartis, and I, I cite Novartis because of its large oncology practice. And not only are they producing cancer drugs, but they're moving into the oncology solutions business and the oncology services business, uh, providing solutions and services to supplement uh, their drug business. And they're doing this as a pharmaceutical company. They're not doing this as a healthcare institution. It's very interesting. Uh, the third group of companies are called value innovators. And the company I would point to there uh, is Medtronic, which is probably one of the most recognized, one of the largest medical instrument companies in the world. Um, and, and I emphasize that it's a medical instrument company. But if you talk to the senior executives of Medtronic today, they won't tell you they're a medical instrument company. What they will tell you is that they're a medical services company. And this was really brought home to me last summer uh, when I visited the head office of Medtronic in Minneapolis. And during a coffee break, uh, I walked out to go to the washroom and I had to walk through this very large room, uh, which was maybe 50 times larger than this room, filled with small cubicles, each cubicle with a computer workstation staffed by an individual. And the person that was escorting me saw me looking around somewhat confused and I said, what is all this? And they said that this is our call center. And they said each one of the people sitting there are actually nurse practitioners. And I said, what are you talking about? You're a medical equipment business. And they said, no, you don't understand. We're a medical services business. And in fact, they provide medical service to 6 million VA patients in the United States. Medtronic has the VA contract in the United States for telehealth remote monitoring and telehealth care as a medical instrument company, not as a healthcare delivery company. Very, very important thing to, to understand. And then finally, the last group of companies, I have this down at the bottom of the slide, is new digital innovators, and this is key, uh, are companies like Apple, Amazon, and Google, who ostensibly have nothing to do with healthcare delivery, but in fact have everything to do with healthcare delivery. And increasingly, uh, this is going to be the case. The one thing I didn't point out when I mentioned the blockchain, which you see on the left side of the slide, uh, is the box at the bottom left, which says devolution of control. Uh, the importance of the blockchain is not only in the fact that it will allow us to pull data from anywhere and encrypt it and validate its, its inclusion in the blockchain, but what it really does is it removes control of data that currently resides in healthcare centers and doctor's offices, et cetera, and will give complete control over patient medical health information back to where it belongs, which is with the patient. The other major uh, event taking place in the last uh, five to 10 years is deciphering the genome, which has really rapidly led us from an era of intuitive medicine through empirical medicine to what we call now personalized or precision medicine. And this too uh, is gonna lead to the democratization uh, of knowledge as uh, individual genomes become deciphered and sequenced and, and the property of the patients to whom those genomes uh, belong. So finally, we end up with what I've put at the bottom of this slide, which brings us to the subject of this workshop, uh, disintermediation uh, or demediation is the other word used in the literature. And all of these things, um, I think you can tell from what I've said, uh, are leading us to the point where the original stakeholders of the system, which were 
uh, academic health care centers, uh, specialist physicians, and in many areas the government, uh, are slowly going to be removed from the system. Um, that doesn't mean that they're going to be thrown out of the system. It means that their role in the system is going to have to be uh, reimagined, reconfigured, uh, rethought. Um, because when companies like Apple and Google and Amazon come in, and they're coming in very, very quickly, um, the government doesn't control those companies. And although the government, at least in this country, uh, controls uh, doctors, um, in the setting of everything you see on this slide, uh, <coughs> you really have to start thinking about what is the role a doctor is going to be uh, going forward? Where is the control uh, going to come from? And uh, how are the traditional stakeholders of the system going to respond, react, and act in this rapidly unfolding uh, new world? Uh, I, I don't think uh, there's anything speculative with respect to what I put on this slide. I think it's all real. I think it's all... Uh, happening, and uh, I would be uh, thrilled to to hear what uh, people around the table uh, have to say uh, in response to this. So thank you very much for your attention, and again, thank you very much for uh, participating today. So thank you very much, Dr. Rosenberg. Yeah. Any questions or any comments? Uh, I'm happy to start. Thank, thanks for that. I, I, uh, I, I enjoyed your presentation and, 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 and learned quite a bit. My immediate question has to do with the notion of democratization. Here. And the question I have for you is, who is a citizen in this democracy? Right? Is it like the way we romanticize the Athenian democracy, but forget that there were slaves and that women didn't vote? Um, and, and, and that this is not a question I'm asking directly of you, but of the, the broader way in which this language is used discursively to, to gloss as if it does actually apply equally to everybody, and yet we already know from the uptake of many of these technologies we've talked about the unevenness and stratification in which it takes place. So I'm wondering how, you, how you've been grappling with that question yourself. Well, there are several aspects to that question, really. And I think for the physicians who are around the table, and there are a few, um, you know, I, I think we've all been struck over the last <clears throat> several years, especially with the advent of the internet and Google, that, you know, patients show up in your office knowing more about what they have than you know. Uh, <coughs> only because they Googled it 30 seconds before they walked into your office, and you may not be know, aware fully of why they're coming to see you. Uh, so, if nothing else, the democratization of, of knowledge is that. Um, the other part of it is uh, knowledge that used to reside exclusively uh, in certain professions uh, is clearly a paradigm that's broken down and breaking down. As I said, other uh, allied healthcare professions begin to practice at a much higher level than their license. And I think that's a good thing, um, because uh, health care and the provision of health care really is an a interprofessional uh, vocation. It, it isn't something doctors exclusively do. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the historical perspective of you know, hospitals in the, in the Middle Ages without doctors and maybe with other power professionals and how care was delivered. Uh, but you're right, uh, the, the access to information today is not necessarily equal, although I, I'm somewhat surprised that uh, just about everybody you see these days is walking around with a smartphone. So I, I, I presume that most people walking around with a smartphone are also walking around with access to the internet. Um, and then the question becomes, uh, just because you have access to a world of information, um, do you know how to access it? Do you know what it means and do you know what to do with it? Uh, which is the other part of existing in a responsible democracy, right? Just because you can vote, does that mean we should give the vote to everybody? It's a rhetorical question. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but at least it's the beginning. 
Yeah, no, it, it's it's a it's a question that's impossible to answer quickly. Um, but but I, I put it out partly because I, I find that you know in, in your talk I, I, I admired how you both engaged with the enthusiasm, right, and also anxieties and real fears that this brings on, not just for physicians or academic medical centers as self-centered stakeholders, but as a question of to what extent is the glossy positive language that will always be coming out of Silicon Valley to be accepted at face value, right? And so this is one of those terms, democratization of knowledge, which you can understand how it resonates so well in Silicon Valley. And then the question is, who, like, from what perspective should we question that and ask, well, is this the right political metaphor? Or is this actually not necessarily an even democracy? But is there a different description of the kind of politics that this will bring about? The, the, to me, the answer is, uh, the, found to some degree in Amartya Sen's writings, in which he described democracy, its relationship to education, its relationship to justice, its relationship to myriad of things. But clearly, the Western, my perception is that in the West, it's conceived as a opportunity for all, but just opportunity, not necessarily a guarantee. But there are differences. Canada versus the US in terms of healthcare, you, you're well aware of, everybody's well aware of the differences. So what healthcare democracy means in Canada certainly is not even close to what it means in the US. So I think one of, for us, when we talk about democratization of healthcare, it's a little bit different here. Than, the other problem that I have with the notion has to do that there were always healers. <coughs> Before people got MD degrees or DO degrees, there was always a healer. Well described by Maño and others. So, are we just changing the physician to an IT expert or to a technological expert? Are, are we just doing kind of a switch in the discussion? Uh, that's one of the questions that that I'm wondering about. But I think that the democratization question is there right off. <clears throat> Comments, question? Maybe I'm, uh, I would like to raise two things, and you raised the first one uh, initially with the mainframe computer to you know a smartphone, which is miniaturization. Everything is being miniaturized right now. If you look, for example, at laboratory tests, you know it used to be a big machine or something, and more and more we will see people being able to have their own tests and their own labs, you know, up, up to a certain point in the house. Mm -hmm. And so this is one thing. And it, it's the same thing probably for radiology. The first MRI is gigantic, and now we're getting smaller and smaller MRI. And the other thing is, so we can, I don't know what you think about the, the impact of miniaturization in the, in the world of medicine. And the other thing is education, education of professional. You know, if I looked at the medical education of medical students today, it hasn't changed that much from what we had it 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I suppose it's the same thing for nurses and pharmacists. You know, they're still learning more or less the same thing. And yet there might be a discrepancy between the way they're learning things and what's coming in the future. So I don't know how we can probably, you know, change the way we, we teach medicine or nursing or pharmacy to the future generation of people who will <coughs> face more and more with, you know, uh, digitalization, uh, miniaturization, and also distant knowledge, you know, today, especially in certain specialty, like radiology, for example, you can have your MRI being done at one place, but it can be read thousands of kilometers away, and with robotics, you will even have interventional radiology, you know, being done thousands of kilometers away with, like, someone controlling uh, some machine or device, and, and, and so, so things will change in the future. What would be your, 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 your thoughts on this? No, I agree. I think um, when I say digitalization of everything, I, I include the miniaturization of everything. But it's, it's more important than that because as things get smaller uh, and cheaper, um, they also uh, become part of this Internet of Things um, world. And what that means is uh, you can be a patient a citizen, if you will, uh, sitting in your living room and not doing anything because there are already uh, instruments available that aren't wearables. Like you don't have to wear an Apple Watch, which I don't. Um, 
to have your, your vital signs measured. There are devices that will just sit there on your coffee table uh, and collect your vital signs, send them off to some AI somewhere that will do an interpretation and send the analysis either back to you and tell you that you got a problem or send it to your physician's office to tell him you've got a problem. Uh, and I think that's where we're going. Um, and it's not 10 years in the future, it's, it's today. Um, I mean, we've demoed some of this equipment here in the hospital over the last couple of months. Uh, it's FDA approved, it works. Um, and it's the type of instrumentation that could change how we provide care for example, in our CSSLD or long-term care facilities where we don't have enough physician coverage and we may not even have enough nursing coverage 24-7. So to have a device that can sit in a patient's room and collect <coughs> vital signs data and, and other things uh, would be a huge change of, of, of paradigm and improve the quality of care tremendously in ways we could never even think of two, three, four years ago. And I, and I think that's where we're going. Could I make a comment? So, I don't disagree with you, and I think it's going to happen. It's the same thing that happened with the glucose meters, which is like common. The same thing happened, I think it was 15 years ago, you know, pregnancy tests. All of these things happened. And they did actually make a huge and positive impact. The problem for me is actually a moral and ethical one. So I actually believe this is all happening. I believe it is going to happen. And I think what I really worry about is, is how you actually control that. So let's go back to genetic testing for HIV. So when I actually was coming to this country, I had to be checked for HIV. It was in 19, uh, 19, 1990 I came here. Because that was part of the, the workup of you had to have your x-ray for TB and all of this usual stuff. As soon as I came here and I wanted to get insurance, they didn't ask you were you HIV positive. They asked you were you ever tested for HIV. Because that put you into a high risk category because most people who were tested for HIV. The problem is, is this would be what you're calling about democratization in some way of healthcare, because the problem is, is within this vast data are errors. Within this vast data are things we don't know that's happening. We once had insurance policy for everybody, and now we're getting rid of people, and so the purpose of insurance is gone. So if I just worry about what this means, and I think certainly as physicians and certainly as PhDs and thinkers and historians, part of our goal has to be, and we should be dealing with the moral and ethical issues of what this vast big data means. Because it really is a de-democratization in some ways. Because if all our data is somewhere and we don't put, I mean, you sent me off on that AI course. And the one thing that, I, that actually to this day has stuck with me is the guy who's writing the programs, is the guy who's determining the future. And this guy, in Silicon Valley, who we're going to assume is moral, but actually isn't, <coughs> because his main goal, goal is to write an algorithm. And I remember the one topic that really impressed me was, you're, you're doing a self-driving car. And so the guy who writes the algorithm, who, what does the car do when it comes to a car coming towards him? So you as an individual will either crash and save the people, you know, the utilitarian thing, um, or you will actually avoid it. But the guy who's done the self-driving car will actually write that algorithm. So in the States, most people want the other person to die. In Europe, most people are happy that maybe you will die if, in actual fact, you save things. So there is a real problem with those algorithms. There's a real problem with these things that are coming up. And I think we, at some stage, not necessarily today, but we do need to address the ethics because it is happening. There is no way we're stopping it. It is going to go forward. We all have patients coming to see us with whatever they've picked up, often erroneous, on the internet. And in actual fact, I do think maybe, as I said, maybe not today, but maybe the next time you should be dealing with some of the ethics and moral issues of what this big data and big data collection actually means. Question? Yes? Oh, um, thank you for your presentation. I've been struggling with what disintermediation means, and this helps me um, put into perspective. Um, I think I, I might disagree with the idea that deciphering the genome will lead to a democracy, more democratization. Um, I've been studying the precision medicine, and I, I think that a lot of precision medicine and personalized medicine is actually uh, a form of marketing. And it, it's coming from the companies that are producing these tests and the drugs associated with them. Um, and they haven't 
really translated into what the promise was meant to be. So I'm, I want to trouble that a little bit. And I also want to bring in the fact that the technology is, is central here in, in the description, but, but where the technology is coming from isn't really present. So I, I want to, to ask you if you've thought about that and the fact that you keep talking about Silicon Valley, um, which is in a way producing some of these technologies in other places. It's, it's more driven by the commercial market than I think it ever has been. So what does that mean for the kinds of technologies that are being produced, and what does it mean for the democratization? If that is, um, as you ended your presentation, where is the control going to come from? Where, you know, that, that kind of influences my perspective on the control. I, I think the, the, the uh, thank you very much. I, I think those were very insightful comments, but I think the, the, the notion that I'm trying to put across here is that and ultimately, there won't be control. And I think that's one of the things that Dr. McNamara is a little concerned about, uh, is, is that there won't be any control. Uh, because I think um, as anybody can have access to any information and have access to any technology at minimal or no cost, uh, which is where this is going, um, there won't be control, but which, which is why I, I specifically singled out the government at the bottom of the slide, uh, because it's, it's, it's getting to a point very quickly where governments will have very little ability to control what's going on, and, and we can have a whole discussion about whether that's good or that's not good, uh, and depending on what jurisdiction you come from, you may have a different view of that. Um, but. I think it's clear that if you look back 20 years, things were a lot more centralized and a lot more in the hands of fewer people than it is today. And, and whether it's uh, companies that are pushing things to make an extra dollar or not, uh, and I, I think that's probably true to a large extent, I, I think the momentum is still in this direction. Um, and we could argue whether or not uh, having something driven by a commercial interest is better or worse than having something driven by a political government interest. Um, and I think that would be an interesting conversation to have uh, because at least for those of us who are in the Canadian healthcare system and in particular in the Quebec healthcare system, you know, once the government runs healthcare, it becomes politicized. and. Once something becomes politicized, it's no longer rational in how you apply it. Um, so to give you one very concrete example, which I know my friend here can identify with, uh, and we're entering into a conversation with our Ministry of Health now about this, uh, minimally invasive surgery, which was the topic of the first workshop that we took up several years ago, I don't think anybody would argue with the relevance, the pertinence, the importance of minimally invasive surgery. Uh, it's probably the most important medical advance of the last hundred years. Um, every time we do a minimally invasive procedure here in this hospital, we lose money because the government does not reimburse us the full cost of a minimally invasive <coughs> procedure because they're still reimbursing us the cost of the old open procedure from 15, 20 years ago. And there's a difference of $400 to $1,000 per case. That's what happens when the government controls health care and makes it a political um, issue because then they've got to play off putting money into health care versus putting money into filling potholes or building bridges or whatever. So whether that's better or worse than having companies push a health care agenda, I don't know. Um, but I would tend to perhaps uh, side with the companies at this point. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Following up on some of the, and thank you, it's a great presentation, but following up on some of the questions in particular about where power resides within healthcare, you know, at the bottom of your slide, you have doctors and government, which I still think even with, if we want to call it the democratization of knowledge or more power to the people, I still think much of the power in healthcare in terms of what gets funded to become miniaturized and more accessible 
in terms of who writes prescriptions for drugs and medical equipment, um, in terms of what's deemed safe for the patient and what isn't, is still controlled largely by doctors and government. Do you see that changing in the last 20 years? Do you see it changing in the future? Where do you see this playing out in terms of who controls the power of healthcare? Uh, I do see it changing. Uh, I see it changing in particular with respect to physicians. Um, and I've, I've lived through it, as has uh, my colleague beside me, over the last four or five years. Or actually, perhaps not Dr. Brunet, because he runs a large medical center. He wasn't thrown into this new network of, of institutions that the Quebec government created four years ago. Um, <coughs> but just in the last four years, uh, given the mandate with these new networks have been given to create continuums of care uh, that are very transversal and interprofessional. Uh, I think the role of physicians in those networks uh, has been, I, I wouldn't say diminished, but certainly um, become more of a shared vocation compared to the way things were before four or five years ago. I think that's clear. Um, with respect to the, the government involvement, um, I, I would predict going forward, given the advent of, of the commercialization of healthcare, and I don't know if commercialization is the right word, um, I, I would predict that governments will have a lot less to say about things once patients actually get access to and ownership of their own personal medical information. Um, and I think that's why the blockchain is ultimately going to be so important. And back, coming back to what Dr. McNamara indicated, one of the important things about the blockchain will be you can validate the data that goes in. So you're not at somebody's whim and uh, putting in questionable data. Uh, the, the, the real benefit, one of the real benefits of the blockchain is that the, whatever goes in there is validated. Um, Already, and I find it interesting that people don't remember it. With the advent of HIV, the practice of medicine, at least the type of practice that I had with HIV patients, changed dramatically. From the doctor patient, doctor telling patient what to do, to the patient not only coming to the office with information, requesting further details, further explanations but to actually control the trials that were taking place. I don't know if you remember, but in the old days, the trials were test drug A versus placebo or drug A versus drug B without an opportunity to be in a non-blinded arm. <coughs> Even that changed. What I found particularly interesting is that this change that took place between, say, uh, early 90s, when the protease inhibitors came in, or the late 80s, all the way into the 2000s didn't have such a huge impact on other groups like cancer, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think the question that history, that historians, which I was waiting for, for somebody to answer, why? Mm -hmm. So the classic explanation that you're dealing with young patients that were vibrant, educated, and so on, versus the older, more frail, and so on, maybe. But I think there is something to be learned from the HIV experience the failure of the cancer experience and what's about to happen now. So why didn't it work? Well, how can we make the patient empowerment to be somewhat stronger? And by the way, to me, the democratization is not giving capacity to nurse practitioners or pharmacists, but giving capacity to the patient. So in answer to some degree to your question, it's the, yes, it's the citizen empowerment. I want to add something, if I may. You mentioned that when the patient comes with quickly Googling the information, it's just information, it's not knowledge. And I would strongly suggest separating the two in your slide. Because no matter how much information the patient has, they, they cannot do anything without it, without the input of the physician who will use this information to guide the patient. So I think that we don't have to worry about doctors as long as they have expertise. Because no matter how much information is out there, especially in genomic medicine, if the doctor 
looks at the results of genetic testing and the patient looks at it, they can read about it for days and not know what to do. So I think information and knowledge are not the same. And I think it's very important. Yes, go ahead. So I just, I, first of all, I think you've taken a lot of really complex concepts and I think you've funneled it down to this sort of healthcare disruption for dummies kind of uh, format. So it's really great. But there's a couple of things. So one is around this whole thing about democratization. I'm not a historian. That was very eloquent when you said I never even looked at it that way. I wonder if it's more of a collaboration though of, of when it comes to knowledge, because I actually somewhat disagree with what you said with this, this distinction between information and knowledge, because I think it really puts this hierarchy around physicians and patients, where patients can't possibly understand where they're coming from. Or what, and, I, and I think that this, like, you know, everyone's sort of trained around patients being the expert. So they come in and they tell you what their symptoms are, they tell you what their theories are around what's happening. It's really important, and we need to really acknowledge that and take that into consideration when you're giving a diagnosis. I went to a, um, a screening last night of a movie called Falling Through the Cracks. Greg's story, I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's a patient in Alberta who um, dies of a blood clot. He's, he's diagnosed with testicular cancer, which is the most treatable cancer. And in the end, he actually dies of a blood clot. He's very, very young in his early 30s. And so this film is excellent because it really it, it highlights all of the failures of the system. And it's the, the point of the film is to figure out how we can improve these different areas. And then these are themes that come across all, all of Canada that you know, these are where the healthcare system tends to fail our patients. And that was a big thing that came out of, there was a lot of um, general public there, and they were saying that you know, we're not listened to as, as patients, and this comes out as a big theme in the, in the film. So I, I just want to sort of put that out there. And I, I just I think that, that, that it's more of a collaboration between uh, patients and physicians, and that's to me, is where the democratization actually comes from. Um, I would say that a couple of points on the, on the, the figure itself is that this idea of precision medicine of being um, leading to democratization of knowledge, I, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily see that only because when we talk about deciphering the genome, I think experts even can't really decipher the genome. I don't know if we know enough yet to have that be something that comes into democratization of knowledge. And also, the it's the the the, the wearables and remote sensing. I think that actually feeds more into this democratization of knowledge. In, in my viewpoint, anyway, that if you have an Apple Watch or anything where you can you can look at your own vitals or glucose monitoring things like this, um, that you are then put into control of of your healthcare data and what's happening and 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 monitoring and um, managing your condition. So I, I'm wondering if that should actually be on the on the other side. And the last point I want to make is this this, this technology and people. I think there's a real connection between these two in the in, in the general <coughs> overarching concept of decentralization. So in the graph, it sort of feels like it's a bit disconnected, where I think everything sort of has these interconnections between them. I don't really know how you would um, how you would show that and not make it too complicated, but what a line yeah, that the issue of knowledge and information is is interesting, and I want to come back to that for a moment because there's a paradox. Um, very often, uh, and this is not anecdotal because I participated in a forum, um, when you sit down with specialist physicians uh, and you ask them why they look after certain patients and don't send them back into the community, they will tell you that they don't trust the physicians in the community to know enough to look after these very complicated patients. So it, it isn't only patients who come to your office and, and with with information that may not be knowledge. There seems to be this disconnect <coughs> between some specialists and some GPs with respect to what each of them know professionally vis-a-vis -vis information or, or knowledge because when you talk to the GPs in the community, they complain that they don't get their patients back from the specialists they send them to and they're not quite sure why. Uh, but the specialists are very sure why they don't send them back. And, and clearly the truth is somewhere uh, in between, I would think. Um, so it, it isn't that, um, that straightforward about you know, patients uh, knowing less or having less insight than specialist physicians would. The other comment I would make, um, again, knowledge versus information, the largest 
uh, waste in the healthcare system, uh, which actually has been calculated for the U.S. to be somewhere in the range of several hundred billion dollars, uh, is based on a, a lack of uh, standardization of care attributed to huge care variation. If knowledge was so important, you would think that the degree of care variation and the waste that it contributes to would be a lot less than it is. Um, and therefore, I think that AI is going to have a very important role to play going forward in standardization of care, in reducing care variation, in reducing <coughs> medical waste, and by doing all of that, by improving the efficiency of the system. Um, so I, I think there is a difference between knowledge and information. Um, I, I think that distinction may be less important <coughs> going forward as it may have been in the past. Yes, Tom. You want to, you want to go first? First, I think it's a, a fantastic discussion today. And thank you, Laurie, to invite me. We have the same uh, discussion at the SHIM today and throughout uh, the network, the international network we have developed during the last 10 years, academic hospitals throughout the world. Until uh, the, really the, the changes that uh, artificial intelligence have uh, introduced, I would say that all the things that uh, have been displayed here during the presentation will just improve what we were doing, or should have improved what we are doing. Because uh, it was just enhancing our intelligence and helping us with new technology to better understand the needs of the patient and enrich the knowledge. However, uh, now AI is able to transform the system and maybe to replace us which is the first time that, uh, first time not in the medieval, because we'll see that it was different before. But I mean for uh, the modern medicine is the first time that the medical doctors will be challenged by something else. And I say something, not, not the other professionals, because we are an interprofessional practice today. And I think that it's not anymore the the, the time to talk about the place of each of us in, in this interprofessional practice. But the, the, real, the real thing today, and this is what we are working on now, on the level of the, this international network, is will we be replaced? And for that, there are two things. What will be the behavior of the customers? I mean the population, but also the government facing with artificial intelligence and the capacity of uh, artificial intelligence to change the way we are working. The second is, we have now a very strong, or I would say huge, competition with the GAFAM uh, in the States and with the BATICS on the other side in China. And Europe and Canada are not well developed in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, big companies. I'm not saying that we don't have the brains here, but we don't have the big companies. And one of the things we are working again at the SHUM is to help to develop a strong economic uh, uh, tissue to help us to change the way we are working. Because it's not it will come, it's already here. When you look at Google Health or Google Doc, they are better than us in diagnosis and treating a cancer today. And why? Because they have a lot of data, billions of billions of data and billions of billions of dollars. So if they want to get the best expertise in the world for a case that they don't understand, <coughs> that there is not enough knowledge, they pay our best doctors and they provide another response. At the SHIM, we have some of our doctors that have been paid by Google. We train them, we pay them in Canada, and they are, in addition of that, they are recruited by Google, but not all the time, just when they need. 
who go like it. So all of these things, is, it's a fantastic discussion here. I am very happy being here because we have exactly the same uh, um, analysis and maybe one thing that I wanted to add is the, the pace of change is increasing every day. It, it's not the pace of change from the medieval to today. It, we are changing every day. Yesterday, I, I gave uh, at the Journal des Affaires uh, 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 presentation, a lecture, and there were people around the, 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 the audience that said, wow, the health uh, sector is changing so fast now. We will add our resources, our money, our expertise to increase and to facilitate the, this, this change. It's not something that is just hypothetical here. It's really. Last thing I wanted to say, I don't, I'm not sure that it will be the, the this intermediation, I didn't understand the world when I came and I said, <laughs> wow, this is really the Jewish hospital, they are always thinking better than us, right? They are even having new words. <laughs> I don't understand the word, by the way. It's, it's because I trusted him and, and all of you that I can. Because otherwise I thought it was like uh, people uh, smoking a pot and, and, and talking about us. That's really, it, it's, it's a fantastic discussion. I'm not sure we will be replaced. We will be replaced only if we miss the opportunity to understand and to use it. And I think this is what is at stake to them. And I'm very happy being here. Thank you. Thank you. Comment or? Yeah, maybe uh, an observation about the discussion, I think, that a lot of the discussion is actually centered around the physician as, as a person, as a figure, as a role. Uh, and uh, the physician can have uh, different functions, different roles that are being discussed uh, separately, but we might want to refer back to, to that, to what we take as a given, and that is that the physician has <coughs> not only the function of expertise in, in the healthcare system, but also of control, of controlling uh, what's being done, uh, as opposed to, for example, the patient or companies, and also, uh, also as a moral uh, uh, instance. So a lot of the, the fears, but also the hopes about the change actually refer to, to the role of the physician more than we've maybe expressed it in the discussion. So what one thing we could do in, in, the, uh, in the continuation of the discussion is also to think, what, what is that uh, figure of, of the physician? What do we project into it? And uh, what, what is the specific uh, role of the physician as opposed to the patient, as opposed to uh, programmer or uh, the companies or even other uh, healthcare professions and uh, what is at stake in, in, in changing uh, the, the role of the physician. Just as an, as an observation of what I think is, has been going on in, in the discussion. And another uh, point is, you, you, asked, you asked the question about uh, HIV AIDS patients versus uh, uh, cancer patients and uh, um, clinical trials. And, uh, and you asked uh, the uh, historians in the room. There are maybe some historians who uh, would give you a better answer, but from the way I understood it from what historians have looked at, it has mainly to do with the kind of patients uh, that you have in HIV AIDS versus uh, cancer, and also the kind of, of problems. So uh, uh, a long-term uh, chronic disease uh, of a group of uh, patients who are already well organized versus uh, a, a disease that's kind of unpredicted. You, you suddenly find yourself with a, a diagnosis, cancer, and you don't have the time to organize yourself. And, uh, Especially since it's it's not a specific uh, cultural so sociological group of patients, that would be a short answer from from the uh, historians. Uh, 
we can discuss it yeah. another time. <laughs> so uh, we will switch to the next talk. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rosenberg <coughs> for his eloquent and excellent talk. Thank you.